It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gunderman today for, for this reason. Uh, and this will embarrass you, Richard, I'm sorry. Uh, Richard is one of those few people who, when I look at his life, I scratch my head and say, that's impossible. You can't do life that way. Uh, I've had the pleasure of, of working in a variety of capacities with Dr. Gunderman uh, for the 12 years that I've been here. I'm not going to read this page of stuff to you. But let me just hit a couple of highlights so that you understand why uh, I scratch my head when I think of Dr. Gunderman. Um, he has both the MD and the PhD from the University of Chicago, the PhD from the Committee on Social Thought. So he's both a physician scientist and a humanist. Go figure. You know, there's not many of those around. I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, Dr. Gunderman's family. He has lovely children, and at least as far as an outsider can see, a lovely relationship with his wife. A physician with good home commitments. Go figure. I know he is active in his own religious congregation, and that that's an important part uh, of life to him. On this list of things are included uh, three books. There are more than that. He, he has authored, edited one of the leading textbooks in radiological medicine. He has written books such as We Make a Life by What We Give, which is a life about how do you live a life of genuine philanthropy out of who you are. A book titled, uh, where was it, Leadership in Healthcare. The breadth is what amazes me. Besides that, Dr. Gundaman is just simply a nice guy. And for that, we are grateful. One of the ways that is most recent for how I've come to work with Dr. Gunderman, he has recently joined uh, the committee of our board of directors of IU Health, uh, the Values Committee, uh, the Values, Ethics, Social Responsibility, and Pastoral Services Committee, and so he is serving as a member of the governance structure of IU Health. Dr. Gunderman, welcome. We look forward to your comments today because we know we will be stimulated by them. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Steve. Thanks a lot. It's a treat to be here. Uh, the title of uh, the talk today is Bearing the Fire. Uh, do you know what that means? Bearing the fire? I, I have a conviction that each of us in this room and uh, our colleagues are bearers of a fire. And we'll talk about what that might mean as uh, our discussion unfolds. Who's this? Do you recognize this person? This is uh, the first patient ever described as having Alzheimer's disease. This is Augusta Della, who uh, was Dr. Alzheimer's very first patient. Uh, perhaps this patient, sadly, has in a sense lost the fire, or the fire is dwindling. And uh, I think it's something we very much need to be mindful of and uh, keep alight, and perhaps even try to pass on to the next generation, burning more brightly than when it was passed to us. This lecture is sponsored by the Fairbanks Center on Clinical Ethics. Uh, I have some convictions I've developed over time about ethics. One is, that ethics isn't simply a matter of right versus wrong. If all we manage is to do the right thing, uh, I wouldn't say we've failed, but we certainly haven't achieved our potential. The word ethics comes from a Greek root meaning character, and certainly character is important. Are you generous? Are you compassionate? Are you courageous? But I think ethics is finally really about reality. This is uh, a work of art by William Blake, one of the great physician artists, uh, perhaps of all time, certainly of anybody who wrote in the English language. Uh, the Religious Leaders Passing Beggars by Rembrandt. Uh, what kind of reality do you and I exist in? Is it a shallow reality. I sometimes have the sense that I'm mired in a shallow reality. 
It's actually the shallow realities that most threaten to drown us. Uh, Where we want to be is in a deeper reality, where we're as present as possible with our patients and colleagues and families, where we can be as dedicated as we possibly can to their care, and ultimately help them and ourselves become as fully alive as possible. The people in this sketch mouth platitudes, but are not in fact fully present or fully alive. So what enables us to go deep? This, of course, is Van Gogh's The Good Samaritan. What enables us to go deep? Well, with time, I've come to think increasingly that it's suffering. Most of us, especially younger people in medicine, have a tendency to hide our suffering. We don't want others to see it because it might imply that we're weak. But in point of fact, I've come to think our woundedness is what most defines us. And if we're going to be the best doctors, the best nurses, uh, the best social workers, the best chaplains, the best human beings we can be, we need not to hide our woundedness, but in fact to lead with our woundedness. This is a man my wife and I take to church most Sundays. He has cerebral palsy and can't speak. Uh, in the course of, of caring, uh, you know, helping to take him to and from church every week, uh, I learned some lessons, which I was never taught in medical school or residency or fellowship or as a faculty member, but that I hope nurses are still taught very early in their training, namely things like how to bathe a person, how to turn a person in bed, how to change the sheets on a bed, how to help somebody who uh, can't bend their shoulders very much, put on a coat. I didn't know how important those lessons were until I I became involved in the care of my own father, who died last year. Some of the profoundest lessons I've learned about bearing the fire came not uh, from the curricula of medical schools or residency programs, uh, but in the course of caring for real flesh and blood human beings. So... I learned some things from the bedside, for example, the bedside of my dying father, which have turned out to be very important to me, like how to read certain texts, like the Bible, how to hold somebody's hand as they die. I don't claim to be good at it, but I now have a deeper understanding of what that means. How to pray. I mean really pray, not that my will should be fulfilled, but uh, that this person should uh, die and uh, die well. And I I hope I managed to learn a few things from that about how to live. And I bet you've had similar experiences. This is Rembrandt's old man praying. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Well, that's the question I want to ask today. And my own sense is that we are human insofar as we bear the fire, whatever that is. This, again, is William Blake. So I had a chance to work not too long ago with a group of undergraduate students in a course with the preposterous title of A Life Well Lived. And we spent an entire semester on three texts, one of which was the Odyssey of Homer, another was the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scripture book of Genesis, and the third is a contemporary novel by one of the most important writers of our age, Cormac McCarthy, called The Road. And I want to see if you and I can make some headway on understanding the fire and what it means to bear it by reading a short passage from Cormac McCarthy's The Road. But before I do so, Let me say that uh, we're inevitably engaged in two processes. When we read a book, a passage from a book, or talk to another human being, including a patient. One of those is exegesis, the effort to try to, to determine what the text means. But the other equally important process is eisegesis. These are Greek words. 
eisegesis basically means reading into the text or seeing, bringing ourselves fully to the text. And I think that's finally what it means to be an educated human being. This is the bust of one of the most, uh, one of the best educators who ever to grace humanity. Who's that? Did you see Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? Who's this? Socrates, right? A.K.A. Socrates, right? It's our encounter with texts that defines us as human beings. So here's a text, one we can all read together right now. This is a man speaking to a boy, a father speaking to a son. The son speaks first. I want to be with you. You can't. Please. You can't. You have to carry the fire. I don't know how to. Yes, you do. Is it real, the fire? Yes, it is. Where is it? I don't know where it is. Yes, you do. It is inside you. It was always there. I can see it. Do we see the light of the fire emanating from you today? To what degree do you see the light of the fire emanating from your colleagues or your patients? You may get your discharge summaries dictated and signed. You may get all your soap notes in very good order. You may check off all the boxes on your consultation list for today. You may squeeze every dollar of revenue you can out of the care you deliver today. But if you and I miss that light emanating from the fire, uh, we may not have failed, but we certainly haven't lived up to our potential as health professionals or human beings. Let's go line by line through that little passage. You and I are engaged right now in exegesis and eisegesis. None of us will see exactly the same thing in these modest, homely little lines, but perhaps all of us will learn something in the course of thinking about them. The first line is, I want to be with you. Who are we? Are you and I atoms bouncing, uh, bouncing around in a void? Or are we perhaps uh, strands of thread in a tapestry? Do you, you and I begin each day uh, with a mindset of isolation? I'm alone in the world. Or do we begin each day with the sense that we're deeply bound up in relationships? I want to be with you. What exactly does that mean? How and why do we need each other? Well, the response from the man, by the way, a nameless character, we never know the name of the father or the son, the man or the boy, the response is, you can't. You can't be with me. Why not? Well, for one thing, there's the problem of mortality. We can't be together always right? Mortality is every bit as natural a part of our nature as our birth. We, we are born and grow and develop no more naturally than we die. We're made to be perishable. Could it be that our very perishability, our fragility, is what makes our lives so precious and so worth caring for? And could it be that it's in that realization that any potential we enjoy uh, to care for one another forever and well lies. Any, anybody recognize this piece of art? Created in the 16th century by Holbein the Younger. This is the ambassadors. It's about explorers, right? There are a number of uh, artifacts here having to do with exploration. But uh, the most important one is right in the middle of the picture but it's so distorted you can't see it. Right here, Holbein has placed an anamorphic skull. 
Here you can see that anamorphic skull uh, viewed in reflection. Why did he put it that there? Could it be that the most important frontier we as human beings need to explore isn't the ocean depths to which James Cameron descended uh, earlier last week, or uh, outer space, the moon or Mars or something, but in a certain sense, the most important frontier for us to explore is our own mortality. Well, the response to you can't is please. What is our position in the universe? What is our mission, our purpose as health professionals and human beings? One possibility that our mission, our mission is to satisfy ourselves and each other, right? The Rolling Stones said, I can't get no satisfaction, right? You can't always get what you want. These are the anthems of rock and roll. But perhaps rock and roll hasn't plumbed the depths of the human experience. Perhaps you and I have appetites and purposes that go beyond our own satisfaction. Things even patient satisfaction scores can't quite manage to encompass. Well, if that were true, what else might there be? William Blake again. Uh, one might be the encounter between God and man, the divine and the human, say in a text like the book of Job, from uh, which this uh, uh, sketch depicts, uh, we're incomplete. We're wounded. We suffer, right? The word patient means one who suffers. Uh, perhaps it's our very suffering that fully opens up our capacity to love. Relationship challenge to you. Uh, hide your suffering from the person you love and see what happens to your relationship. Blind yourself. Distract yourself. Uh, pretend it doesn't exist, the suffering of the person you love, and see what happens to your relationship. Please, the response is, you can't. You can't be with me always. You have to carry the fire. What does that mean? One possibility, it means survival. Carry the warm blood into the next generation. Keep human blood coursing through veins. That seems to be what Charles Darwin thought, right? Life is all about survival. Today we might say life's about consumption, you know? Oh, what kind of motor vehicle did you park in the garage this morning? Was it a, 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 a two-door subcompact or a European luxury automobile? Right? Maybe that's what it's all about, enjoying the good things in life. My own sense is uh, certainly a better attitude would be to regard our lives as a, as a bit of an adventure. They're played out in a way on a small stage, but perhaps at stake in the events on that small stage are matters of cosmic significance. That, that would be perhaps a uh, biblical interpretation of human life. What's, what's the most precious thing in the universe? Is it something we can be aware of, something we can perhaps even carry? Well, one possibility would be that that precious thing in the universe is uh, its awareness of itself. The sun is much bigger and much more powerful than you and I, but so far as we know, it is completely unaware. The thing that makes us special and other living organisms is that we're aware and when it comes to human beings, aware in a particular way that gives us the capacity uh, not only to react to stimuli, but actually to marvel at and perhaps even love uh, creation, or at least some of the created things like some of the people seated in this room right now. Perhaps what we bring special to creation is the capacity uh, to love it, or parts of it. And that may be the spark of the divine in us, right? It's not, how can I make more money? How can I advance my career? How can I retain my job? But uh, what am I here for? Why am I here? Perhaps those are the biggest human questions. We get caught up in the technology. 
We get caught up in the management theory. We get caught up in reducing errors and uh, trying to improve the bottom line. By the way, I'm not here to say those things aren't important. I devote a fair amount of time to them, but those are not ultimately what it's all about. What, what's that image? That's the Tower of Babel, right? A homely little allegory in the book of Genesis about the human effort uh, to make gods of ourselves through technology. If only we could answer the how question, we would become like gods. Well, the message of the Tower of Babel is not so. A, to be human is never to be God. There's no surer way to lose our humanity than to aspire to make gods of ourselves. And in fact, uh, whatever it is that's divine about us, it's not finally our techne, our technology. It's our capacity to marvel and love at uh, creation, and I suppose ultimately at the source of creation. Well, the answer is, uh, I don't know how to. The boy says, I don't know how to. What are we supposed to pay attention to? How do we know, how do we judge what we're really capable of? Well, one thing is we can turn to laws or the people who enforce laws or rules. The policies and procedures manuals of IU Health provide guidance on what you and I are supposed to do every day. But you and I know that the most important things we do each day aren't really addressed in those policy and procedure manuals. They don't finally describe while we're here, we're here with a much deeper human aspiration, namely to, uh, I suppose, learn how to be human by caring well for other human beings. And if you see that as a law, love one another as you would like to be loved. Here's an even crazier idea. Lo love one another as I have loved you. I'm not the I in that sentence. Uh, laws become not constraining, not confining. They're not like handcuffs on our wrists. Laws viewed in that sense actually become liberating. I don't know how to. Well, you know, uh, your humanity is not a given. Our humanity is an achievement. It's something we must strive for. I mean, sure, we all have uh, 10 digits uh, on our upper limbs, and we all are uh, 46XX or 46XY, right? Our genotype. But uh, in another sense, our humanity is uh, very much in doubt. It's something we need to strive for and hope we achieve to some degree. That's kind of a crazy idea. What do you mean by that? The fact I'm breathing doesn't mean I'm alive. The fact uh, that I have color vision and a complex vocal apparatus and upright posture and opposable thumbs doesn't really mean I'm human. Well, if you've ever played a musical instrument, you might understand what I mean. Uh, before you can play Bach or Mozart or Beethoven, you have to learn the rules of the instrument. You have to spend months, years, maybe decades in practice following the rules before you can begin to assume those rules and express yourself creatively by playing the music. At one point in life, I was pecking out the notes. At one point in life, I was pecking out the letters on the keyboard. It took a long time to learn how to do that. But at some point, if we're fortunate or blessed, we learn how to use those keyboards, not merely to follow rules, but actually to express ourselves. And that's the point at which we begin to make music. It's a big investment of time and effort to get to that point, but I think it's one well worth making. The man responds, yes, you do. You do know how. How can that be? It's precisely because it's in the living uh, that the learning takes place. How alive are you 
at Methodist Hospital. How alive am I? Yeah, I'm here. I show up on time. I stay till the work is done. But uh, to what degree are you and I really alive, fully human in the work we do every day? Again, the idea that we can live superficially. You can follow all the rules. You can never run afoul of the policies and procedures manuals and yet, uh, in a certain sense, go through your life sleepwalking. You can be a technical wizard like the people building the Tower of Babel, but a human dunce, right? Our mission is ultimately to try to drink deeply of this experience and uh, to take what we discover, what we come to believe from the lessons we learn at the bedside or through the encounter with great texts and uh, allow those beliefs perhaps to transform us. Perhaps you and I aren't all we can be. The boy responds, is it real? The fire? Is the fire real? Tough question, right? What color is the fire? How much does the fire weigh? Where is it located? Who can point to it? Those are tough questions to answer. And some people conclude from the fact that those questions are tough and not amenable to laboratory analysis that there must not be any fire. And the moment we uh, conclude there is no fire uh, is the very same moment we, be we begin to descend into hopelessness, right? Our lives become uh, potentially chaotic and uh, disordered. I begin to say to myself, I just want to avoid trouble in life. I aspire to a life of ease with a comfortable income, a comfortable um, routine at work, a shallow but comfortable sort of family life. Uh, and, and that's it, right? I want to avoid trouble. That, that could be a problem for... Uh, for a human being. It matters a lot what we call things. What do you call the people you care for? You know? What could you call? Well, you could call them patients. I suppose you could call them customers. There are a lot of names you could apply to them. It could be that, that one of the keys uh, to our own salvation lies in calling things by the right name, right? That's what makes Adam in the creation story, that what, that's what makes human beings special. We're the ones who name everything else. And that responsibility to call things by the right name is perhaps our very greatest. Is, uh, is love an itch? Is love the result of a shift in hormonal balance? Is love uh, a change in the presence of neurotransmitters at synapses in the brain? Well, the answer to all those questions might be yes, and yet uh, that might not tell the whole story. You know, maybe there's more to say about love. Maybe there's more to say about suffering than those sorts of accounts can reveal to us. So... Uh, Yes, it is. Yes, what is? Is it real? The fire? Yes, it is. How, how, do you, how do you remind yourself of the fire? How do you rediscover the fire? Because if, if what I'm saying is correct, if you lose that, in, in a sense, the game is up. You've lost it all. So remaining aware of and somehow connected to the fire to, to, to keep bearing it in ourselves is, is one of our most important missions. How do you do that? Well, it, it could be uh, that we've been uh, given some tremendous gifts to help us do that. One is art. This is Caravaggio's The Calling of St. Matthew. Matthew's the guy with the finger pointing. Who, me? No, you mean him. Right? This is how most of us respond to the call. You can't mean me. I mean, after all, it's how even, uh, say, Moses responds to the call. You, you don't mean me. You mean uh, my brother. Right? You must be talking about Aaron. 
So anyway, works of art, music, literature, which could include books like Homer's Odyssey or the book of Genesis, but I would say also include a contemporary living author's work, Cormac McCarthy. Uh, we need to keep what matters most foremost in our field of vision. And for a lot of us, what matters most gets consumed by little things, sort of secondary issues, and we find ourselves losing the thread of the primary issues. What's the art that makes up your life? What kind of music do you devote your time to? What kind of literature do you keep company with? My, my proposition to you is, if we fill our lives with crap, we will end up leading crappy lives. Forget about the food you put in your mouth, whether you eat healthy or eat poorly. Who cares? Right? What really matters <laughs> is the food, in this case the art, music, and literature that we put into our minds or our hearts and our souls. You, you can eat all the deep fried sticks of butter you want, as far as I'm concerned, as long as you manage to attend uh, to what you're feeding your soul with. And somehow, healthcare organizations frequently become uh, idolaters in that regard. We spend all our time worried about serum cholesterol levels. What's your lipid profile look like? And sometimes we forget about the most important food for human beings, which really can't be measured by any blood test, right? The boy says, where is it? I don't know where it is. That's our situation. I don't know where it is. Uh, the point of this discussion is that the quest to discover the fire, to figure out where the fire is, not just in great works of literature, but in the person seated nearest to you in this room right now, that uh, that's really our quest. Where is that fire? If you take that seriously, you might say the best thing about human beings is not our technological wizardry, but finally, it's our curiosity, right? Who's that? That's Odysseus, Ulysses, right? James Joyce, Ulysses, more important, Homer's The Odyssey. Uh, Homer calls him repeatedly the man of many ways. The only way we can figure out where the fire is is by looking for the fire from multiple perspectives. And that's where art and music and literature uh, can be our most important aids. We need to look at it from multiple perspectives. Part of it may be what we can see with a blood test. Part of it, I'm not sure about this, could even be what we see when we biopsy our patient's wallet. But ultimately, there's something much deeper, much brighter that we need to see that tends to get buried by the way we organize and deliver healthcare today, but which is desperately important for us and desperately important for our patients because the degree to which we're disconnected from it is the, deg the degree to which we really won't be able, finally, to care for our patients. The man says, yes, you do. Yes, you do what? I don't know where it is. Yes, you do. It's inside you. It was always there. I can see it. The notion is that this fire isn't something we light within ourselves, but was there before we became aware of it. And the question is, do, do we uh, tend to extinguish that fire, or do we help it burn more brightly, emit more light, illuminate more of what's really caring about, worth caring about in human life? We're not trying to win some race, garner some award, right? Nurse of the year, doctor of the year, chaplain of the year, healthcare executive of the year, 
uh, we're trying to be human beings. And being human means caring for other human beings, recognizing the suffering uh, of those in our midst and trying to respond in a human and humane fashion. Maybe that's what it means to play our part, you know, as human beings and as healthcare professionals. Uh, I suspect that this uh, trans, uh, that this this light is uh, not only illuminative but transformative. And there are good examples of it in one of the texts that the students and I spent a lot of time on uh, not too long ago. Abraham used to be Abram. Sarai will become Sarah. Jacob will become Israel. Paul or Saul will become Paul. Who are you called to become? Part of the question is, who are we? But finally, perhaps a deeper part of the question is, who are we striving to become? Or who do we most need to become? The encounter with the kind of texts we're talking about today, Homer's Odyssey, the book of Genesis, and uh, Cormac McCarthy's The Road, is, uh, is a transformative one, at, at least if it works, if, if it catches fire in us, if it fans the flame of our own fires, it will be a transformative experience. You see, that's finally what prophets are. Prophets aren't people who predict the future. Prophets are people who interpret our lives, help us see what our lives really mean from another perspective, a higher perspective. Some might, might want to say a divine perspective. What, what story won't your CV tell about you, your resume, your obituary? What residual will remain after we've read your obituary or if we peruse your CV today? That's the question, right? That, that's what a prophet would have us consider, not, not our position on the organizational chart or our income or how many awards we've won, but uh, who we're called to be who you would need to be uh, to be the most real version of yourself you possibly can. Well, how do we get there? Largely through words. It's what we read in books. It's what we say to others. It's what we tell ourselves when we think we're alone that ultimately defines us and either forecloses or opens up that transformative potential. Well, here, mercifully, is the last slide, or at least the penultimate slide. Let me read you a passage from a book that lies at your fingertips. It's by Cormac McCarthy. It's called The Road. It was an Oprah's Book of the Month Club selection. It won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. But, of course, none of that matters. I want to be with you. You can't. Please, you can't. You have to carry the fire. I don't know how to. Yes, you do. Is it real, the fire? Yes, it is. Where is it? I don't know where it is. Yes, you do. It's inside you. It was always there. I can see it. What does it mean to bring life to human life? My own sense, it's things like classes and texts and teachers. What kind of a teacher are you and what are you doing to bear the fire and help the rest of us do a better job of bearing the fire. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I think we have maybe five or ten minutes for conversation. We'll, we'll see if this provokes any objections or 
questions or comments. It's a terrible thing when we sit in stony silence, you know, after somebody's made a profession of this nature. Please. Yeah, I, insofar as I understand what you've said, I agree with you that on the one hand, you could see your life as, an, as a challenge to make yourself as big relative to everybody else as possible. I want to be top dog. I want to be king of the hill. I want to be big man on campus. So I do everything I can to draw attention to myself and make sure everybody knows that I'm the winner, right? They haven't won as big as I have. Maybe they've even been defeated by me, right? Because this, I'm, you know, I'm down in the Gatorade. I'm here to win. Only one person gets out of this room a winner. That's going to be me. Show me what I need to do to make sure that's the result. That's one attitude toward life. But there are many successful people in organizations who, who see life in those terms. I'm convinced of that. But uh, that's certainly not the only way to see life. And it could be that ultimately you'll lead a more fulfilling and a more human life, not by trying to make yourself big and everybody else small, but by helping all of us round around, uh, rally around purposes in life that are bigger than uh, every one of us. There are things in life more important than we are. Some of those things more important than we are a lot more important. And uh, ultimately, it's whether we figure out what those are and live lives that are faithful to that vision that I think determines uh, not only how good our lives are, but ultimately whether we've lived at all. And uh, that's what the fire is all about, right? The warmth of human life. How do we tend that fire? How do we share that warmth? Other questions or comments? Oh, that's a good, yeah, I should have. You put the raw. I need to speak to this now. So raise your hand, I'll get the mic to you. That immediately says no one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing that, Steve. I have a question about the uh, degree of Bible literacy or scriptural literacy that you assume in your presentation. Uh, do you find that a, a difficult thing with your uh, students? And you know, do they have the, a degree of literacy that would make a presentation like this sensible to them? And if not, how do you account for that? Yeah, how do you I, correct for it? My, my own sense is one of the great disservices we've done to education in the last 40 or 50 years, at least in the United States, but really in Western Europe as well, is largely to rule sacred texts out of bounds uh, in public education. You know, you shouldn't read the Tanakh or the New Testament or the Quran in school because that would be a form of proselytizing that would violate uh, some constitutional separation between church and state. There are certain things that uh, students must not read. And among those texts are, are the foundational texts, uh, the very most sacred texts of humanity. And, you know, it could be the Bhagavad Gita or, or 
something else, the Upanishads. It doesn't have to be uh, the book we call the Bible. Uh, that's a huge mistake. Whether, whether you're a person of faith or not, we simply don't have any better texts for thinking about what human life could be and uh, the deleterious consequences of getting that, that question wrong. We simply don't have any better texts, any better catalysts available to us uh, than those sacred texts, among them the Bible. So he, he, I, I would suggest even somebody who was agnostic or perhaps even more than mildly atheistic, from my point of view, should want their children and grandchildren and their neighbor's children and grandchildren to understand those texts because they offer us uh, the profoundest metaphors and the most beautiful allegories for thinking about what human life is about. I, I find uh, many students uh, do catch on with this sort of thing, but, but literacy about these sacred texts is a problem. And uh, maybe it's something that uh, our public schools should address. And, and in, in the absence of a serious response from our public schools, maybe it's incumbent on each one of us to look for other opportunities outside of public education uh, to foster serious and reading and discussion around these kinds of texts. I, I really think it's one of the best possible uses of our limited time. Your time to read is limited, so try to make sure you devote a fair amount of it to the things very most worth reading. And I would submit that three of those texts might be Homer's Odyssey, uh, the book of Genesis, and uh, Cormac McCarthy's The Road. You, you'd have to try them for yourselves. I will say this, those texts are devilishly difficult to encounter in isolation. If you try to read them by yourself, good luck. Uh, I really think we need to read them in the company of other people who share our curiosity, perhaps our passion, and that's really the only way they'll real, uh, yield up their treasures. They're not meant to be discussion enders. See what it says? That's the way it is. I, I th I, my own sense is they're intended to be conversation starters. They're intended to open up inquiry and uh, stimulate us to think about what, what, what our lives are. Any other questions or comments? I think that's a no. What do you think, Steve? Uh, I'll make a comment on your, on your last comment there, if I may. Um, for those of you who wonder, well, how do you do that? How do you have those conversations? Dr. Gunderman and colleagues have put their energy behind exactly that principle. They have an ongoing uh, group of medical students uh, and other interested folk who have these conversations, is it weekly? Monthly. Monthly. With that, I know that they actually sponsored this at St. Vincent's. I see Karen Eisner here. That's an ongoing conversation there, isn't it, among a variety of, of medical folk. So there are ways for people to do exactly what, uh, what Dr. Gunneman is suggesting uh, that we do uh, in those, those ways. So. Yeah, and if you and a group of your friends or colleagues are interested in, you know, trying a dangerous experiment and uh, thinking about books like this, reading them seriously and thinking about them, I would be a willing conversation partner. I've come to think this is one of the very best things to which we can devote our lives. And uh, I, I try to put my money where my mouth is. So if, if you're serious about it and you have a group of people who are serious about it, and if I can uh, serve some purpose in helping to get the discussion started or uh, maybe rekindling the fire from time to time, I, I'd be delighted to do so. I think it's one of the best gifts you could possibly give to a human being. Your parents, your spouse, your children is to open their eyes uh, to the reading of these kind of books and reflecting on what they have to teach us about what it means to be human. And I, I hope it's an opportunity you'll be moved uh, to, to pursue. And, and I say again, if I can help in that, please let me know. 
He puts his own money as well as my values grants money for that end, too. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for your time, for your thoughtfulness. In, in my religious tradition, after such a presentation, there's usually an altar call extended. Uh, we, 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 we won't give you permission to do that today. Uh, nevertheless, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gentleman, for your presentation.